All right, if everybody could please take a seat. We're going to get underway with panel number two now. If everybody could proceed to their seats. We have a very important guest at lunch, so we need to make sure we stay on schedule. Um, our next panel is Asia Flashpoints and China, Expecting the Unexpected. The idea here is we're going to take you sort of on a tour of things that you may not know about or may not be paying attention to in the Asia security landscape related to China, but which you should. And we have an excellent panel here to talk about it. So I'm going to hand it over to the moderator, David Ahn, of the Global Taiwan Institute. Great. Thank you, Matt. So for Asia's flashpoints and China for this session, are we talking about the US and China as a flashpoint? Uh, flash between, flashpoints between the, uh, China and the rest of the region? Flashpoints within China? Um, and after discussion with the organizers and, and Matt and the panelists, we're going to address each of these things. And what usually comes to mind first when we think about flashpoints in China is we think about Taiwan. Is that going to bring the US and China in together? South China Sea with China's island building and militarizing in, in that region. North Korea issues with uh, its te testing of long range missile programs. But we're going to go beyond uh, these ideas that first come to mind to go deeper into the, uh, the issues today here on this panel. So we're going to move beyond that, and I'm going to introduce um, our panelists here who will join me for this discussion. We have uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Green, the Senior Vice President for Asia and Japan Chair at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and an Associate Professor at the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. He served on the staff of the National Security Council from 2001 to 2005. Next to him is... Abraham Denmark, and he is the director of the Asia program at Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, which conducts independent research and hosts frank dialogues to develop actionable ideas for Congress, the administration, and the broader policy community on issues related to the Asia Pacific. Prior to joining the Wilson Center, uh, Mr. Denmark served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for East Asia. Next to him is um, Dr. Uh, Alyssa Ayers, and she is a senior fellow for India. Pakistan and South Asia at the Council on Foreign Relations. She came to CFR after serving as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for South Asia from 2010 to 2013. Um, I'm David Ahn, Senior Research Fellow at the Global Taiwan Institute, previously at the US State Department as a, a political military officer covering East Asia, and then previously also in the private sector as a senior project manager for the THAAD missile system. So with that, uh, let's move directly to the panelists. Uh, each of them is going to speak around five or 10 minutes um, uh, on a, a topic on Asia's flashpoints and China, starting with Dr. Green. Um, could you please lay out the threat landscape in Asia? Thank you. Um, thank you very much, David. And uh, thanks, Glenn and Matthew, uh, Georgetown uh, graduate and uh, Jamestown Foundation stalwart. Um, I always enjoy coming to the Jamestown Foundation. I've been doing things here with Glenn and company for uh, probably a decade. I'm trying to remember how long. But uh, Jamestown has been prescient and co both consistent and prescient about China um, for a long time. I hope I don't break that perfect record today with some of my uh, predictions. Um, so uh, Glenn and, and, and Matthew and, and David asked me to think about hotspots, flash spots uh, in Asia. And the first thing I would say is YAP. Um, and all of you remember the Great YAP War, right? <laughs> there was no Great YAP War. And so I want to start with YAP as a kind of a caveat, because in 1920, 21, 22, the US Navy, uh, the War Department, were convinced that the greatest hotspot, the greatest chance for war with Japan was going to be YAP, because Japan had taken YAP uh, uh, in Micronesia from Germany in World War I, uh, and the U.S. undersea cable, uh, which was being built to uh, provide communications for our bases in the Philippines and elsewhere, uh, was going to run right through it. And so in uh, 1922, the U.S. and Japan reached an agreement in Washington as part of the famous Washington Naval Treaties um, to uh, let the U.S. have access to YAP. And in fact, the U.S. never fought in YAP. Uh, in the Pacific War, uh, YAP was left uh, behind in the famous island hopping campaign, and the Japanese garrison surrendered in August 1945, hungry, starving, but never having fought, aside from being bombed from time to time. So I mention that because if you did this conference in 1921, um, the, the 
Carnegie Endowment, which was around at the time, <laughs> uh, would have invited naval officers and others, State Department officers, who would have said, the hotspot is Yap. Um, but it wasn't. Um, uh, however, it's also a, a, an excuse or a, a way to think about what was really the Casas Belli, what was really um, the cause of war with Japan. Why did Japan attack in 1941? It wasn't Yap. Uh, but there were larger issues. Um, and in many ways, strategists at the time missed them. Um, not all, but many. Um, for example, um, one of the major factors in the U.S.-Japan War uh, was the Pacific War uh, was the collapse of economic interdependence. Um, the Great Depression, Smoot-Hawley tariffs uh, meant that Japan went, went from being highly interdependent with the United States uh, to, uh, within a year, losing 60% of its exports to, to the U.S. because of American protectionism, because of a global financial crisis. That structural factor in the economy led to radicalization and militarization of the Japanese army, uh, bada boom, bada bing, um, geopolitical factors like the Nazis' success uh, in Europe initially in the war, all of these things um, created the structural conditions for war. So it's not going to be YAP, and it's not going to very likely be, uh, if there is a war someday, any of these issues I list. Um, we don't know what the proximate cause will be, um, but we do know there's a structural competition with China, and we do know that there is great power rivalry, and we do know that uh, uh, China is, um, is moving away from reform, is moving away from economic interdependence in many ways, and is moving in a more nationalistic direction. Um, and so I'm not saying history will repeat, but some of the structural factors are the same. So with that as a preface and caveat and mini history lesson on YAP, um, which is fun to say, by the way, if you ever do a talk, um, let, me, let me highlight a few um, areas where, um, where we should be watching. So I'll say Taiwan first, because a lot of people in the audience care about it, and, uh, and it's pretty straightforward and obvious. Um, the Zhang Zemin white paper on Taiwan almost 20 years ago um, premised that if Taiwan didn't unify, there would be use of force. The 2005 anti-secession law in China under Hu Jintao changed that and essentially said if China, excuse me, if Taiwan declares independence, we will attack them. Um, a lot of people are reading uh, John, uh, Xi Jinping's speech at the 19th Party Congress and his statement about reunifying China by 2050 uh, as a return to the Jiang Zemin uh, formula, which is if you don't marry me, I'll kill you. Um, if you don't unify, we'll use force. Um, that's still debated among the experts. Maybe the previous panel addressed it. But the hard power uh, corollary is very evident uh, in the PLA Air Force um, exercises around Taiwan. Um, the deployment of new systems like the S-400, which give the PLA air defense coverage of over Taiwan from the mainland. Uh, the technology, the capabilities, the intent make it clearly very dangerous. Um, second, a classic Cold War hotspot, one we've forgotten about, but when I was in the NSC, one I spent a lot of time on. And that's the, the Yellow Sea, the West Sea off of Korea. It's quiet now, but the reason it's so dangerous is because there is no DMZ when you get to the ocean. The armistice didn't settle that. And so you have what's called the Northern Limit Line, which is contested by all the parties, by North Korea, South Korea, and China. Um, and even the US position on the Northern Limit Line is a little bit ambiguous compared to uh, incidents on the DMZ. And so there are two reasons why this could potentially explode. The, the first is accidental. Um, global warming has moved the fishing stock and the crabs into the most strategically sensitive areas of Asia, including Senkaku's, but also the Yellow Sea. And Chinese, North Korean, and South Korean fishing fleets go out in April and escorted by patrol boats. And they, until recently, every third year or so, shot at each other, sometimes lethally. When this happened um, eight years ago, um, the North Koreans deliberately laid an ambush for the Korean corvette Chonan, sank it. Um, then opened fire on Yongpyongdong, an island in the West Sea, uh, under the orders of Kim Jong-un, who was you know, gathering his military bona fides. Um, the South Koreans, under Lee Myung-bak, had F-15s on the tarmac ready to strike targets in North Korea if it escalated any further. Um, we now have a US-Korea counter-provocation plan so that the Korean side will coordinate with us. 
the motto of the US Korea Alliance is Kachi Kapshida, we go together, which means Korea doesn't go alone. Um, so we have something of a joint um, plan on how we would deal with these kinds of provocations that are not clear violations of the armistice and the DMZ. But um, I am suspicious that the current diplomacy with North Korea will succeed. And I think there's a real possibility North Korea will go back to um, provocations and testing, perhaps emboldened by nuclear weapons. And the Yellow Sea is probably where they do it. Um, uh, a third one, um, and um, you know, maybe uh, Alyssa will say more about this, but water. Um, uh, water security is incredibly important in Asia. China doesn't have enough water for its urban development plans. India doesn't have enough water. Pakistan doesn't have enough water. Um, the rivers, 10 of the 11 major rivers in South and Southeast Asia flow from the Himalayans, uh, from mountains controlled by China, heavily militarized by China. China's um, built dams, 20 plus dams around the Mekong, um, and has not followed through on agreements with India to share hydroelectric data and other things that were supposed to be confidence builders to prevent a conflict over water. Uh, uh, damming water could be a national security threat that leads to uh, force. Um, and then the last one I'd mention, um, space and cyber. And I combine them because we know about cyber, but space, um, uh, cyber connection in Asia, I think, particularly with China, is, is dangerous. China's 2007 anti-satellite test demonstrated that Beijing doesn't care a whole lot about the norms on these issues. Yes, the US and other countries did ASAT tests in the past, but China did it after the norm was established. You don't do these things with enormous space debris. Um, and the new Chinese uh, PLA strategic support force designed to support space and cyber activities in military conflicts appears to have the mission of blinding the US, Japan, other allies that use space. Th that may be seen in Beijing as a way to dazzle and confound your opponent before you go kinetic and shoot at each other. But it also blinds your opponent in an environment where missiles and nuclear weapons and operations all depend on space. And we don't know, theorists, government, militaries, we don't know how e escalation dominance works in space. We don't know how you deter. There's a lot we don't know. We learned these things in the nuclear realm, which, which, um, which Abe will talk about, because we almost killed each other in the Cuban Missile Crisis. We have not had the kind of crisis in space where we understand how to control this escalation. So, so space, cyber, that combination. I say cyber because um, you can blind satellites using cyber if you're sophisticated enough. Um, and that would make an otherwise uh, manageable crisis extremely dangerous if both sides are blinded. Um, and the, the PLA seems to have a doctrine to blind uh, us in a crisis. So um, there's another dozen I could give you, but I've probably done enough to keep you awake all night. Um, I'm not predicting war. I think it's, it's still very unlikely in Asia, but these were the areas that I thought were worth uh, focusing on. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Green. Uh, and for Abe, uh, if you could share your perspectives on the region and especially on nuclear dynamics in the region. Thank you. So I was going to talk mostly about YAP, but I guess I got <laughs> it. Sorry, so, yeah, really stole my thunder on that. Um, well, thanks. And again, thanks to Jamestown for having me uh, speak here. Um, uh, every year, this conference is uh, always very interesting. I always learn a lot from it, and I'm always happy to, to speak. So thanks for, for inviting me again. I did, um, when I was talking with the organizers about sort of security issues that are a little bit on the back burner, a little bit below the surface, um, what immediately jumped to mind uh, for me was nuclear issues um, between the United States and China specifically. Um, in my experience, um, dealing with these issues um, in the American um, group of uh, strategic thinkers, a lot of, not a lot of China experts know much about nuclear issues, and lot, not a lot of nuclear experts know a lot about China. Um, and the overlap in that Venn diagram is, is usually pretty thin. Um, and that really came out to me a few years ago, before I went into the Pentagon, um, I did a, a joint study for CSIS, for the Project on Nuclear Issues, on the US-China nuclear relationship. I co-chaired that with uh, Bridge Colby, uh, who now is also a fellow bearded ex-DASD. Um, and um, we brought together nuclear experts and China experts. And a lot of that, a lot of our work was really getting the China people up to speed on nuclear issues and getting the nuclear people up to speed on China. So I think that's a real concern of mine because I think the nuclear issue between the United States and China is going to become more important. Uh, not to say that I believe that nuclear war is a concern, should be a concern, or that is possible or likely. I actually think nuclear conflict between the United States and China is uh, diminishingly unlikely, 
but it is a critical aspect of the background of our relationship. And it informs a lot of our interactions across a whole host of other issues uh, in ways that um, if you don't have a good grounding in this, um, it can be difficult to understand. So I wanted to give people here an update about where the Chinese are on nuclear issues uh, and then describe what interactions between the United States and China have been uh, to give you a sense of sort of where we are and why I think it's a concern. Um, the Pentagon, um, as most of you all know, puts out a very a good report every year, a public report on China's military power. Um, and I think it gets better uh, every year. Uh, they keep adding on to it. And I, I'm, I always um, try to read it the first day it comes out. One of the things that came out on the most recent edition that didn't get a lot of attention was updates about China's nuclear program. Um, they are, they've developed a, uh, a new, um, made operational, their Jin class uh, SSBN, uh, which is now operational. Uh, representing China's first credible sea-based nuclear deterrent. Um, and they're building a next generation type 096 submarine um, um, with a new SLBM that should be coming out in the early, 20, in the early 2020s. Um, they are building new, uh, new bombers, strategic bombers, including uh, a stealth bomber was announced uh, by, by their leadership, um, which should, um, uh, could include a, a nuclear payload as well. Um, they're also developing uh, their aircraft with two new air-launched ballistic missiles, which is kind of interesting. Air-launched ballistic missiles, uh, which may include a nuclear payload. And their um, newly constituted um, strategic rocket forces are also building new uh, ICBMs, the DF-31AG uh, and the DF-41, um, with new capabilities, road, mo road mobilities, et cetera. Uh, meaning that taken together, that um, China is um, getting close to building, for the first time, a true nuclear triad, uh, which we haven't seen before. And that's an important development um, that um, sort of sails under the radar, no pun intended. Um, they have a, a, their policy of no first use still remains in place. Um, but for those of you who don't look at these things, don't read PLA academic journals, um, there's a lot of discussion about what that no first use policy actually means with many PLA theorists, as, as some of you have, have read, read and written about, talking about launch on warning, um, as being compatible with the no first use policy and bringing back to space, there's, uh, uh, the Chinese are actually um, developing a space-based early warning capability that would enable them to actually be in a launch on warning posture. Um, despite these dialogues, and as we talk about, as some theorists talk about the idea that with the trade war, with more com competition between the United States and China that we're entering more of a Cold War style relationship, I actually think that's not a good label. I think it misunderstands the Cold War and misunderstands our relationship with China. Um, but one thing that's important, very different between those aspects is that the level of dialogue between the United States and China on nuclear issues is basically non-existent. And that may be surprising for some of you. There's been one meeting at the PAC-1 level between the United States and China in April 2008. I, was, I, I know I was there. I was the most junior guy in the room. Um, and since, uh, other than that, there's track 1.5, track 2 dialogues um, that occur between various think tanks, some government officials, military officials from both sides uh, participate in their personal capacity. I participate in those as well. But the idea that there's no steady, regular meeting between the United States and China on such a critical issue for the security of both sides is really striking to me. Uh, something that um, myself and a lot of others have pointed out uh, as a problem. In our, in, our, in our relationship. So in these meetings, especially in the track two dialogues and the track 1.5s, um, you get a lot of some feedback from the Chinese to give them a sense of their perspective uh, on these issues. I wanted to share a few of those with you. Um, they see a tremendous disparity in our nuclear force sizes. They, and they see that as a reason why they don't really believe we need to have a, a dialogue on nuclear issues, saying you, you, the United States is so powerful in, uh, in its nuclear capabilities. Uh, China's capabilities are so small and so backward, we don't even need to worry about arms control or anything. You guys are so dominant, we don't need to worry about that. And any discussion of transparency is really just a tool of the strong against the weak. Um, they do um, acknowledge that their force structure is modernizing, um, but they say that the US is still much more advanced, um, that modernization is natural for a growing country. And they also talk about, I think this is very genuine, they face a very complex strategic environment. Um, that it's not, for them, it's not only about deterring the United States, they also have to worry about uh, Russia, India, um, and 
depending on who you talk to, sometimes they talk, they worry about North Korea as well. Um, they're concerned about U.S. missile defense capabilities, uh, THAAD being one of them, but um, the introduction of X-band radar before that, um, they don't really distinguish between theater and national missile defense capabilities. Um, occasionally, you'll still hear concerns about conventional prompt global strike, uh, which they think is much more capable than uh, it actually is. Um, in fact, I was several years ago, I was at a meeting in Beijing, and they said the United States, in order to have stability with China, the United States needs to cut conventional prompt global strike in half. And I said, that's no problem, because half of zero is zero. So, <laughs> done. Um, but that's still something they point to, and their concern is that if the U.S. has large enough conventional strike capabilities and large enough missile defense, that that could obviate their secondary strike capabilities, their retaliatory. That's their concern, and what some point to as why they need to build up their capabilities a bit in order to react to these changes in U.S. posture. Um, not to say that this is all China's problem. Uh, there's some challenges for the U.S. as well. Um, in our report that we did for CSIS's project on, on nuclear issues, one of the questions that we got hung up on in our, in our own group was on the question of acknowledging uh, nuclear vulnerability. Um, the idea of mutual assured destruction that we had during the Cold War with the Soviet Union is not something that um, the United States has embraced with, with China. In fact, when we briefed this issue on Cong to Congress, one of the staffers, um, their first question was, why would we acknowledge vulnerability to a bunch of communists? Uh, which historically is a fascinating question. Um, but um, the idea is that the, some believe that the United States should not acknowledge or even allow for vulnerability to Chinese nuclear weapons. Um, and with some of the statements that have come out of the current administration about uh, nuclear dominance, about invulnerability, um, it does raise some questions. Um, personally, I agree that there's really no benefit to acknowledging vulnerability to the Chinese. I don't think we get much for it, and it would drive a lot of concern amongst the allies. Um, but that drives me to the last point I wanted to make to you all about why this is so important uh, to the United States, is that the Chinese are very critical about extended, about U.S. extended deterrence commitments. Um, they describe them as um, uh, coming from the Cold War. They say that they're the drivers of potential instability and conflict between the United States, that we can handle this together as, as partners, but once third parties get involved, then they cause all sorts of problems. Um, but the flip side of this is that in the face of China's rising power and uncertainty about the reliability of the United States, um, there's an increasing potential, in my opinion, about our allies uh, in, in East Asia looking more at developing their own indigenous nuclear capability. Um, not in the current government in Korea, but if and when conservatives come back into power, I think there's a tremendous potential that this, uh, that this Right now, even out of power, conservatives are talking about the need for the United States to deploy nuclear weapons to the Korean Peninsula, which is a stalking horse uh, for talking about um, developing indigenous nuclear weapons. Support for that in, in polling amongst the Korean people goes up and down over time, uh, as, most, as a lot of polling does in Korea, um, but it ha overall has been higher than before. Even in Japan, where I think developing nuclear weapons is, the potential for that is extremely low, there has been more conversation about that, about that issue. Um, as a former uh, Minister of Defense in, uh, I think it was in 2017, talking about this issue, um, tying it to questions about the, uh, the United States. Um, so what to me this means, um, the, the conversations in Korea and Japan about indigenous nuclear weapons are not really about a newfound love of nuclear weapons. What it's about is about concern about the United States and concern about the reliability of American power. So the nuclear aspect of that um, is, is just one facet of enhancing our ability to reassure our allies. That's much more about conventional political commitments rather than our nuclear posture. Um, but engaging with the Chinese on nuclear issues, um, talking about the need for some version of strategic stability, although the Chinese don't like that term, with the Chinese, um, and making sure that these critical issues with the Chinese are, are managed and handled well by experts on both sides, I think is something that's very important and something that has been, uh, at least in the last 10 years, relatively untouched in official government. So I wanted to uh, focus on that. There's, uh, I could talk to a lot of other issues, as, as Mike mentioned. Um, yeah, thank you, Abe. Uh, if I could add a little to what you're saying. 
um, from about U.S.-China nuclear dialogue, the need for dialogue. Uh, from my experience, when I was at the State Department as a political military officer, 2009 to 2014, um, our colleagues in the ISN Bureau, International Security and Nuclear Nonproliferation, every year would approach China and try to get that dialogue on nuclear issues. And then every year would be turned down. They would work up the agenda, start pulling um, experts together, trying to approach China for a US-China nuclear dialogue. So from my experience in government, it's really tracking a lot with what uh, Abe's saying. Um, our sense, our speculation was that fear of vulnerability, uh, fear of transparency. You know, Maybe the US could learn something and that may, might make uh, China more vulnerable. So that's, well. For uh, Dr. Ayers, uh, if I could please ask you to speak uh, based on your expertise on China and the South Asia region. Thank you very much. Pulling in the Indian Ocean into this conversation, I think it's uh, a general tendency, certainly in Washington, to think about uh, security challenges in Asia. And Asia kind of just means East and South. I was very happy that for this particular discussion, uh, the organizers decided to pull in South Asia and try to really enlarge the scope of things we should be talking about, things we should be tracking, things that we should be concerned about. What I wanted to do is pull us, as I mentioned, more to the West, and I wanted to begin by talking about economic security concerns. And here I'm going to pull in uh, the development of the Belt and Road and what that has meant for some of the smaller countries in South Asia. You could really argue that, that the dramatic uptick in infrastructure investment uh, in the smaller countries of South Asia has been one of the most significant changes of the past decade. Um, it's not a change in kind, it is a change in degree. I would also argue that these type of investments have been underway in some cases for decades. Uh, but you do have a, a, a real kind of uh, amping up uh, the, the economic flows and what that is creating, particularly from the perspective of India in New Delhi, strategic planners in India, is a real concern that uh, India as the, the region's traditional uh, power may be losing influence in its own region. People will very often say in India there's you know, only one ocean named after a country, meaning the Indian Ocean. Uh, and as you have seen over the course of the last 10 to 12 years, a much larger and more assertive presence of China across the Indian Ocean region, a lot of people in India uh, becoming very concerned about what that means down the line. I'm sure people in the room here will remember the string of pearls phrase, everybody? Yes, string of pearls. So this is a term that came uh, out of a Booz Allen report in 2005. Uh, but it's actually quite useful to think about. The idea of the string of pearls strategy, if we remember, was that China was looking to develop uh, sort of locations across the South Asia Indian Ocean region some point down the line, uh, perhaps provide a military base, some potential use in the future. So if we think of that rubric and think about what we've seen unfolding, and I'm going to start getting into more detail here, you could actually, and again, 2005, the Belt and Road Initiative was announced in 2013. You could really make the case that South Asia is the predecessor region of the Belt and Road. If you think about China's engagement, uh, for example, with Pakistan, the development of the Karakoram Highway, which connects the western part of China down through the Himalayas in Pakistan and down into uh, almost the, the very top of, of Punjab. Uh, that was begun in 1959 and completed in 1979. So there's a very deep history of infrastructure investment and partnership in this region. Uh, but it's not just Pakistan. China has very deep ties with Sri Lanka. I think people may be familiar with this case. It's now become fairly well known and written about because of what happened as the result of the techniques of financing this infrastructure development. Uh, again, this didn't begin with the 2013 announcement of the Belt and Road Initiative. These kinds of infrastructure financing in Sri Lanka began really in the mid-2000s. Um, we've got a, a Chinese relationship with Maldives. Again, it became quite important uh, during the latter part, at, let's say around 2010, 2011. China was one of only two external uh, diplomatic uh, facilities in the Maldives. They opened an embassy in 2011. Now Maldives has many more embassies there, but at the time it was one of only two. 
outside the region. So having that kind of, of deeper engagement with these smaller countries in the region, um, I, I just want to underscore that this has been going on for some time. Now, of course, with the Belt and Road Initiative, as I mentioned, this has really kind of plussed up uh, the level of activity and investment. Uh, I mentioned the China-Pakistan relationship. This is a relationship that has been described by officials and uh, proponents on both sides as higher than the highest mountain, sweeter than honey. I mean, it's got a, a very kind of poetic way that people refer to the importance of this bilateral relationship. Well, it now turns out that the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, CPEC, is the single most important component of the Belt and Road Initiative. There have been various estimates of pledges for what the CPEC investments uh, will add up to. Uh, and again, this is not sort of to be realized tomorrow. It's on a kind of three decades time frame. Uh, but the number that now people are referring to is about a $62 billion series of investments. These are infrastructure investments on things like building new and upgrading highways, uh, building new and upgrading railways, developing more power plants, a huge fiber optic network, ports, it's it, a massive series of investments. Um, and as has happened elsewhere in the region, I'm going to turn to Sri Lanka in a second, it is also now becoming increasingly clear to people in Pakistan that these investments aren't gifts, they're not grants. These are uh, uh, financing mechanisms that will come due at a certain point and Pakistan is economically vulnerable to begin with. It has had a long history of economic challenges. In fact, just yesterday, uh, Pakistan decided to reopen a conversation with the International Monetary Fund. Uh, another bailout, it only has about $8.4 billion in its reserves, which is not enough to cover its imports beyond the end of this calendar year. Uh, if it does go ahead and receive another bailout from the IMF this year, it will be its 13th since the late 1980s. So I think that gives a sense of the real question of economic instability uh, in the country. Uh, this is happening on top of what I think is a very well-known case at this point. I'm glad the case has become more well-known. Uh, we were watching this case, you know, eight years ago. That's the case of the Hambantota port in Sri Lanka. Um, as a result of the rising debt burden that Sri Lanka faced in trying to figure out how to continue financing its, its um, debt obligations to China, it ended up essentially trading a debt for equity swap in this port, uh, turning the port management uh, and the port itself over to a Chinese state-owned enterprise to basically hold and run for a 99-year term. Uh, this specific port is now what most people are looking to as the poster child for debt trap diplomacy when you hear this conversation about what exactly the medium and long-term impact of the Belt and Road Initiative will mean. But I'd also like to flag that there's another case coming down the line. That's the case of the Maldives. Uh, depending on how uh, there's now been a new government elected to office, so they're going to have a transition of power in November. But depending on how the incoming government decides to handle this debt challenge, uh, again, in the course of the last four or five years, uh, Maldives have, has received an airport upgrade, a new bridge, a port that's been relocated from where it had been. This has all been underwritten by China. Uh, and their public debt has risen. Maldives has had problems with debt. But in any case, there was a new study. I would commend this study done by the Center for Global Development. Um, forecasts public debt to GDP for 2018 in Maldives at 100%. The World Bank has placed Maldives at, quote, high risk of debt distress. So will there be another case with Maldives of looking to some equity swap way to manage this debt? We'll have to see how this unfolds. But there is a very, very real concern in Maldives uh, about what that means for the islands and their territorial sovereignty. I'd also like to flag the country Bangladesh. I, chances are most people in the room are not focusing much on Bangladesh. It's a very interesting country. Uh, it is not economically at risk in the same way that Pakistan and Maldives and Sri Lanka are. It has a much stronger economy, uh, a, a robust garment industry. Um, but questions, too, are being raised in Bangladesh about the level of debt exposure that it will have to China, how vulnerable it may be. Um, there is approximately $30 billion in financing commitments for various infrastructure projects. 
projects that have been signed between Bangladesh and China. So these are all questions that people domestically are raising. I should note here that the question of China's financing and vulnerability in these countries has become political issues in all these countries. In the 2015 election in Sri Lanka, in fact, the issue of debt to China was a politically mobilizing factor. In the recent election in Maldives, people were talking about debt to China and what that means for Maldives' sovereignty. Um, it's not that infrastructure support itself is a question of vulnerability, but at, nor is it a question of a flashpoint, but it leads to the larger question of if these smaller countries do have great indebtedness down the line of uh, having to convert territory in exchange for this debt, what does that mean strategically in the region? I'll tell you exactly why this is a big fear and concern in New Delhi. Uh, each of these countries uh, becoming more deeply enmeshed with China, it's not clear about what the end game will be. In 2014, there was the case in Sri Lanka of a Chinese submarine showing up twice in Colombo port. Uh, that caused people in New Delhi to say, wait a minute, what is going on here? Um, in, in Pakistan, the port of Gwadar, which was developed as a civilian port, of course, which not have a lot of economic, there's not a lot of trade going through Gwadar. Uh, but there is now uh, the idea that this could, of course, become a, a, a logistics, uh, naval logistics space for the Chinese. Does that mean a base? Uh, does that mean a base down the line? And these are the kinds of questions that people are asking that they're concerned about. China, of course, as does India, also uh, now has a military base in Djibouti, which gives it another space uh, to reach it, uh, in its own maritime path across the greater Indian Ocean. So uh, I would also note here that the concern is not merely economic and strategic, but there is also a concern about what this has meant for the shape of certain kinds of governments and the question of, of, of how those governments have performed in some of these countries. Um, unstinting Chinese support for the previous Sri Lankan government ended up leading uh, to a kind of a situation where Sri Lanka's relationship with India became more troubled because India was focused on questions of democracy, uh, reconciliation, and accountability at the end of what had been a 30-year-long civil conflict in Sri Lanka. Um, you've seen in the course of the last four or five years a similar attenuation of New Delhi's relationship with the Maldives. Again, similar issues where New Delhi has expressed concerns about democracy questions, the uh, government that was just voted out in Maldives declared a state of emergency in February, put a bunch of judges in jail, was ready to pick up opposition members. What happened then? All of a sudden, warships from China showed up very close by in the Indian Ocean, as if to signal to India, hey, we've got this. Your influence isn't needed here. So, you know, it, people are looking at these developments and wondering uh, what the end game is going to be. Um, that gets to some of the economic and competition for influence questions between India and China in the region. I now want to cover uh, India-China bilateral tensions, of which there are many, and I hope people in the room are tracking these issues. Um, India-China tensions do present their own possible flashpoint. Obviously, these two countries fought a border war in 1962. They have an unresolved border that's more than 2,000 miles long. China continues to claim parts of territory that have long been part of India. Um, these tensions, ongoing and perhaps deepening over the course of the last 15 years, have also involved things like territorial representations on maps, um, the way maps are labeled and what territory looks like on things like uh, Google Earth and Google Map. I mean, anywhere you can think of a map and what it looks like, there have actually been issues about how the uh, area of Arunachal Pradesh in India is represented. Um, tensions between the two countries have also involved cases of China refusing to grant visas to Indian citizens if they're, they were born in a part of India that is claimed by China. So there's a very live territorial dispute there still. I mentioned the uh, unresolved border dispute. Every year there's always uh, what are called transgressions. These are called transgressions and not incursions because the border isn't fully demarcated. So it's both a question of movements along the border as well as a question of both sides don't define what the border <coughs> actually is in the same way. Oh, two minutes. <laughs> 
Okay, yeah. Um, each side has their own claim over an incursion. You've seen uh, in recent years the transgressions have increased through the latest stats uh, for 2017. There were 426 transgressions. In 2016, there were 273. In 2015, 350. So it does seem like they're increasing. Um, there were more, there were 500 in 2014, so that increases off a decrease uh, from four years ago. Uh, but that goes to the point that there's something happening more or less all the time on the India-China border, which is worth paying attention to. Last summer uh, was the summer of the Doklam standoff, where India and China ended up in a 73-day long uh, military eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball standoff on the Doklam Plateau. Now, this was not exactly an India-China border dispute. This was a border area disputed between China and Bhutan. And the agreement between China and Bhutan was not to disturb the status quo up until the time that the border uh, has been demarcated and resolved. Uh, China began to uh, develop and complete a road. India decided this was too much of a security risk and brought their army in to defend that territory. Now, in the end, this was only resolved due to uh, a BRICS summit that was being hosted by China. But I just want to flag that this specific territorial issue isn't going away. Um, I've run out of time, so I'm not going to cover the case of Tibet. Uh, maybe somebody will ask about it. Uh, but I do think that it's important to, to keep your eyes on this region because there are not only bilateral issues that could be flashpoints between India and China, but bigger questions of regional geopolitics and what it means to see uh, very, very deep investment in a region uh, and what that might mean 20 years down the line. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Ayers. Um, so before we turn to the audience, uh, my, my question to the panelists are how um, China's handling of its domestic issues um, affect its international and cross-strait relations. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing that connection with domestic issues with China, with uh, the Uyghurs in Western China, and how that could, could influence um, other Muslim-majority countries in South Asia. Um, I'm thinking about uh, China and with the Dalai Lama situation between China and India, um, and also recently with the Holy See and the Catholic Church and China and how that could influence relations across the strait with Taiwan. So um, if you could share uh, some of your views before we turn to the audience. Thank you. Bart, um, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, in the big meta view, uh, uh, the sort of Thucydidean trap, which um, is getting a little tired, but nevertheless is a good starting point for these discussions, the idea that rising powers, China, status quo powers, the US will inevitably fight. Um, there's interesting research to suggest it really depends on the transparency, uh, accountability nature of the regime. Um, and that the reason Britain and the U.S. didn't clash uh, where other rising powers, Japan, Germany, did was not because we all spoke English. Theodore Roosevelt wanted to go to war with Britain in, as late as 1897, but in fact because the British could access our system and understand it. And there was that accountability and transparency. And so the fact, um, yes, the crackdown in Xinjiang upsets the Muslim world and will have an impact. I'm sure Alyssa can speak to that. Yes, the crackdown has a clear effect on the view of people in Taiwan or in Hong Kong. Um, but also, at a macro level, the fact that the Chinese uh, system is becoming more opaque, more centralized, more authoritarian um, is an issue for other major powers. Um, and it's unmistakable. And you can see it in uh, Vice President Pence's speech last week. Uh, which pointed to, among other things, United Front activities in the U.S. You can see it in Australia, where there's been an increased attention uh, and bipartisan Labor Party, Liberal Party uh, pushback with new legislation against interference in um, politics. And you can see it in Singapore, for example, where traditionally benign neighborhood associations, family associations um, of Chinese uh, have been almost entirely taken over by United Front candidates uh, directed from Beijing. So. This is all an as aspect of what you're saying. And so it's not just the obvious and immediate horrific um, uh, developments in Xinjiang. It's the nature of the state, since, especially since the 19th Party Congress uh, under Xi Jinping. <clears throat> just on that, and I'm sure um, Anna, Alyssa will want to talk about the Dalai Lama uh, and that for India, just 
you know, for those of you who don't know, um, several years ago, China passed a law that it's illegal to be reincarnated without government uh, approval, um, which actually has very serious implications. Ruin my plans. Um, the <laughs> 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 that's, that's, a, that's a great line. Um, <laughs> um, but that, that actually has very impl important implications with India. I did want to talk, though, about um, the uh, uh, relations between China and the Holy See. Um, several weeks ago, they reached a long negotiated agreement um, about the selection of Catholic bishops in China. The Chinese Communist Party would uh, have a say in who's selected, um, but as would the Holy See. And they arranged um, some sharing, power sharing arrangement that would allow for officially sanctioned uh, churches and bishops uh, under the approval of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, Paved the way for official recognition of the Holy See of China which does have implications for Taiwan. Um, the Holy See being um, one of the few countries left in the world that still recognizes Taiwan, and the only country in Europe. That recognizes. So if that were to shift, if uh, the Holy See were to uh, join many of the other countries in recent months that have been recognized in China, um, Taiwan's <laughs> diplomatic allies would lose a foothold in, in Europe. That does have important implications. In terms of the crackdown on, on um, Uyghurs, um, I, I and I, I'd be interested in what Alyssa thinks. My sense is that this does have the potential to damage China's relations uh, in the Middle East, Southeast Asia, uh, uh, Muslim majority countries like in, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia. But I suspect it's not going to significantly damage their relationship with Pakistan. Pakistan, in my in my, my sense, is talks a lot about um, um, supporting Muslims all around the world. Um, so long as it also supports its interests. Um, but, of course, uh, Liz is much more of an expert on that. Um, but we do, I do think it's important, to, as Mike mentioned, to recognize more the broader theme that um, authoritarian regimes generate their own security challenges. Um, and even with China, for all of the uh, external security challenges that it faces, it's much more internally focused and much more afraid of its own people than they are of the United States. That's true with most or with most other. Quickly on, on the question of China Pakistan ties, the um, there's been a debate in Pakistan about uh, whether and how to raise the question of a crackdown uh, on the Uyghurs. In fact, this has been a kind of publicly discussed issue in the newspaper. Did, did Pakistani officials raise this at all with the Chinese government, or did they say they raised it and actually didn't? Um, so you can see there isn't even clarity on the question of who raised what issue. I think that there is uh, clearly, at some level, a sense in Pakistan of wanting to be uh, supportive and raise the question of uh, challenges that Muslim populations face in other parts of the world. Uh, but I think there is also a very clear sense of not wanting to curb this very most, actually the most important bilateral relationship that it has, particularly at a time when the CPEC investments are so enormous. Um, I, I did want to mention uh, the case of, of Tibetans and the Tibetan population living uh, in exile and the Tibetan government living in exile in India. Um, there are more than 120,000 Tibetans living in India. Of course, the central Tibetan administration, the government in exile, is in Dharamsala in India. Uh, the, it's where the Dalai Lama lives. Um, some years back, the government uh, separated the role of spiritual authority from the role of political authority. And so the community held a, an international election, and they've also elected uh, a, a president who handles political affairs, distinct from handling spiritual affairs. But uh, this is, at some level, another source of potential tension between India and China. Protests in Tibet. Imagine this becoming a flashpoint on top of other issues that already exist between both countries. Um, there's, and here I would also recommend a very, very good paper by Arky, who's now at SAIS, about potential sources of India China tension. Identified the Tibet issue as something that could be layered onto uh, a, a number of other existing tensions. The question for the Tibetan community at this point is how they can 
think about maintaining their culture uh, with what looks like the prospect of long-term residents in exile from their homeland. So you do see the Tibetan government in Dharamsala developing things like new curriculum uh, for the language, um, new curriculum. Uh, to ensure that everybody has access to training in Tibetan language from, I, I believe it's, I hope I'm not getting this wrong, but uh, the cultural replication has now become quite important to the community. Last fall, uh, the government in exile held a, a, an international meeting called 550, thinking about where they will be and what they should be focused on five years from now, 50 years from now. So this is an issue that has no immediate resolution possible flashpoint. Great, thank you. Uh, now we'll turn to the audience. We have until noon, it's about half an hour. So here in the front, please. And name and affiliation, please. And uh, the microphone's coming. I won't ask them to run. <laughs> yeah, please. Thank you very much for your great conversations. I'm Takahiro Motei at CSS uh, Japan Chair Business Fellows. And my question goes to Dr. Green. You mentioned four flashpoints in the Asian region, but you didn't mention our most concern, which is Senkaku Island. So don't you think it is a one of a flashpoint? Thank you. Yeah, I've been instructed to say yes. <laughs> uh, I, would, I would add, though, I think, um, I, I, you know, the balance of uh, power, the order of battle um, in the East China Sea between Japan and China, particularly when you add the, the U.S. military power that backs up Japan, <clears throat> makes it much less likely than other areas where the PLA uh, or other maritime services will be tempted to um, uh, exploit um, weaker powers, Philippines for example, or Vietnam, which is not a treaty ally, and to exploit um, uh, the sort of ambiguous areas in American security commitments. The commitment to Japan on Senkaku is, I think, as close to unambiguous as you can get. <clears throat> um, uh, the, the only way to get better would be to have a joint and combined command with Japan, which I favor, but is not going to happen soon, like we have with Korea, which triggers you know, things more um, not automatically, but more with more certainty. But nevertheless, every administration since this came up uh, in the 1990s, including President Obama, have said Article 5 of the Security Treaty applies to Senkakus. You know, this, the, the security commitment in the U.S.-Philippines Treaty is a little grayer, and we have none to Vietnam. So that's, that's why I think if you go down the island chain, um, the risk goes higher where the deterrent is less impressive. And the MSDF, Maritime Self-Defense Forces, is, is, are still pretty impressive and will be for some time. Right. There's so much interest, so many hands. I'm going to bundle them. That way we can cover more ground. Um, these two in the front left, please. Uh, Trudy Rubin, the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, just to follow up on what Dr. Green just said, um, uh, do you consider the Spratleys yap? Or do you think uh, that there really might be a crisis? And I'd also like to ask if someone, uh, Dr. Ayers, could comment on the impact of Chinese involvement in ports that belong to friendly countries to the US, for example, managing Haifa port and involvement in Piraeus. I'm uh, Bertel Holin, University of Copenhagen. I would like to uh, put a question to uh, Dr. Denmark uh, about the nuclear weapon. Uh, I mean, during the Mao time, was no problem because uh, Mao said, well, let the war come and we'll survive uh, because uh, most people will live in the countryside. This has changed, of course, considerably now. But uh, the, the question is, yeah, um, uh, China has uh, conducted this uh, minimum deterrence uh, uh, policy and uh, to a certain degree they still have, but there's a change now, and uh, a serious change. But do you think that this change also has something to do with uh, they still feel there is a certain superiority, although there's no superiority in, uh, in atomic weapons, uh, as uh, Kissinger said in the old times. But there is, because it's a, it's a political weapon. So uh, do you think that uh, um, uh, China will, uh, in the long run, uh, again, Th think in direction of, uh, uh, of arms control. Or uh, another question is, how do you assess uh, 
the uh, um, uh, the uh, anti uh, uh, missile defense of, of China, which is a, a, a huge problem. I'm hearing questions about Spratleys and Yap, um, China using ports for friendlies like in Haifa, also um, nuclear weapons. Does Well, Yap hasn't gotten this much attention in Washington <laughs> since 1922. It's very, it's very exciting, um, except for Bud Cole's book. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, no, the South China Sea, the Spratleys are obviously a potential hot spot. <clears throat> the fact that um, uh, China has built three artificial islands in the South China Sea, that Xi Jinping promised President Obama he would not militarize them, and then the PLA militarized them. Um, and even the recent um, uh, unsafe maneuver at sea uh, against a U.S. Uh, uh, warship uh, all indicate that um, part of uh, uh, Beijing's plan is to, I think, is to demonstrate that China's risk tolerance is higher than ours. And that's the game of wills that's going on. But ultimately, <laughs> Beijing's strategy is not to force war with the United States. Far from it. All the open source literature, all the documents show that the, the PLA itself thinks they are one, two, three decades behind, you throw in the US Navy, the Australian Navy, it's not a fight they want at all. So they're, they're pushing below the level of war um, and to, to demonstrate that they have greater willpower than we do and that they're more committed to their flamed Shansha district and, 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 and First Island chain um, and Nine Dash Line and all that. They're more committed to that than we are to defending our allies' freedom of navigation. So in that sense, it is dangerous because in this test of wills, I think the Chinese strategy is cabbage peeling, salami slicing, but basically to demonstrate to the region um, uh, and to our allies, without whom we can't operate, that they are, that we're scared, more scared than they are. And frankly, I think they won that for a while. I think they won that. And I, uh, I think there were some aspects of President, Vice President Pence's speech that, or the national security strategy that were maybe a little too rich, <laughs> a little too rough for some of our allies, but I think it had to be said. And, um, and to restore um, the, 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 the U.S. also has a risk tolerance to defend our interests. The reason I brought YAP up in part was because, um, and this is a sophisticated audience, but it, it, so often when people talk about the South China Sea, they raise the question, why would we fight over a bunch of rocks? Why would we fight over a bunch of islands? And that's not the point. The point is, what is the larger chessboard that we're thinking about here? And I think it's about what I just talked about, American credibility and American alliances and American alliance commitments. It makes you think about the problem differently. Um, it doesn't mean necessarily we have to think about attacking Chinese islands in the South China Sea, but it makes a lot of sense to start aligning ever more closely with Japan, India, and Australia. Because if China's goal is to hit the center of gravity for the US, our alliance network, which is bilateral, then part of our answer is to say and signal, you keep pushing us, you're going to end up with maybe not a NATO in Asia, but a much more collective security system that you won't like. So the chessboard is much bigger than just the island is, is what I was getting at with the YAP thing, aside from the fact that YAP is fun to say. <laughs> Clear policy. Um, I don't believe that China's fundamental approach is going to change dramatically in terms of um, still adhering to a no first use policy and a, uh, a, a basic strategy of absorbing an attack and then retaliating, um, at least uh, rhetorically. Um, they do get some, some benefit out of that. Um, but what I, what I always think about, what I uh, emphasize with uh, people who discuss these things is that unlike in our system, or in even in, like in the Soviet system that we're used to studying, uh, China's system is not governed by you know, laws. That if, if Xi Jinping, for, for some reason, to say, OK, let's use nuclear weapons first in this conflict, it's not like there's some JAG lawyer that's going to say, but, but sir, we have our no first use policy. Um, that they still, you know, they, it's still, um, capabilities are agnostic when it comes to policy. So I, I don't put t tremendous amount of, of comfort in that. I think that deterrence works because deterrence works, not because of any specific policy that the Chinese may be. That being said, I don't think that they will change. And in terms of interest in arms control, they have, the Chinese were initially, going back decades, reluctant to sign on to things, even to sign on things like the non nuclear non-proliferation treaty. 
sort of the, the basic fundamentals of the nuclear nonproliferation regime. But over time, um, they saw that it wasn't a trick by the imperialists to keep people down, rather an aspect of them entering into the world. And they gradually signed on to that. I don't think that there's much of a danger of us entering into bilateral arms control negotiations with the Chinese so long as, until US and Russian um, numbers go pretty significantly down. Um, but I do hope that we can have more broader discussions, less about arms control and more about transparency. We'll take a few questions from the back. Um, the gentleman with the black suit and also the gentleman in the very back uh, with the striped tie. Uh, those two for now. I guess you're referring to me because I got the microphone. Um, I'm Charlie Parton from Rusi in London. Uh, Dr. Green, I'm very glad you raised the question of water, which I think is one of the most fundamental ones. Leaving aside the, the looming water crisis in the north of China, which to me is the reason why China won't be the biggest power of the next of this century. Uh, going back to the transboundary water, first of all, India, what can India do as a big country when China is taking so much of its water and not giving its information? Indian diplomats always said to me that the number one item on discussions between India and China, unless there was an incursion, was the water question. And secondly, you talked about small countries. What can the countries of Southeast Asia, of, of Vietnam, um, Laos, Burma, Cambodia, Bangladesh, or even Kazakhstan do when China takes the lion's share of the water? The other gentleman will combine the questions. Um, the gentleman in the back had his hand raised. Yeah. Uh, my name is Sali Hidayar with the East Turkestan National Awakening Movement. Um, on the topic of uh, expecting the une unexpected, as uh, China integrates more tightly with Pakistan, uh, is it likely that Pakistan will borrow uh, China's concentration camp models used in East Turkestan in dealing with the uh, Baluch or even the, the uh, Waziris? And is anybody uh, expecting this? Thank you. Right, water crisis question among um, major powers like uh, India and China, also among small countries, and also Pakistan about using the uh, re-education camp model. It's, I think the question really is it's hard to know what countries can do. In, in the case of, of, for example, the India-Pakistan-Indus Waters Treaty, when they have a dispute, there is a place to manage a dispute. The place to manage the dispute is the World Bank. Uh, China and India don't have a similar agreement underway to deal with these questions. So that is one reason why people are in India upset about not having received this information about water usage, because it has downstream effects. Um, what smaller can country, countries can do, similarly, they can raise this issue, but uh, raising it diplomatically and not receiving a response is uh, increasingly challenging for countries. Mike, I, you, I think, have done a lot of work on this, too, so please. Um, first of all, I agree with Charlie's uh, point that um, water shortage is, is one of the, maybe the top issue, but one of several issues that are going to interrupt China's upward trajectory economically. Um, I was, I'm a Japan guy by training, and I was in Japan and doing doctoral research when everyone thought Japan was going to take over the world. And it was, it was humbling for about 10 minutes <laughs> for experts. And now we're predicting these straight linear trajectories for China. And I think water is, is, is one of the biggest problems they'll have. There's not enough water for the urbanization rate China has. That's not necessarily good news, news in terms of security, though, because a, a as Rich Armitage puts it, a frustrated um, and grumpy China is actually worse in some ways um, uh, than a China that is uh, more confident. And so it doesn't make this problem easier, it makes it worse, uh, because there will be more domestic pressure on the government, on, on the party, more quest crisis of legitimacy, more pressure to use coercion um, to get water. Um, and so what do we do about it? I think, um, it, it, you know, it's, 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 as Thucydides said, the strong do what they uh, will and the weak do what they must, um, uh, and uh, w we need to give the weak a few more options. <laughs> um, and so in Southeast Asia, um, 
the Obama administration had the Lower Mekong Initiative to try to, and it was pretty thin, but it was the right uh, move. Now there's a bill in Congress called the Build Act to provide considerable um, uh, sources to um, OPEC and other lending agencies in concert with Japan's JBIC and potentially Australia and India and others to give countries alternatives for infrastructure. Um, a lot of what Japan is doing right now quietly is training uh, experts to um, do due diligence on projects. Um, our position on civil society, transparency, a free press, those all really matter because we want to shine a spotlight uh, on these infrastructure programs. And, you know, we've seen the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, um, fractured by China's, um, uh, you know, bulldozing right through the decision in 2016 over the, the, the tribunal decision about the Philippines case. Um, we need to, as frustrating as it, as it is, to start rebuilding support for ASEAN. The bottom line is if we have a um, all of government, it's a cliche in this town, but all of government, but, but especially all of the um, countries that care working in concert the way we potentially could with the Quad, uh, with the EU and others to support all the things I just said, that's something China won't ignore, to include the UN even. The, I mean, China is not going to ignore norms uh, if there, it really is the major powers of the world uh, pushing with the United Front. We haven't done that effectively yet, but I think that's basically what we have to do so that Southeast Asian countries have a little bit more of a, of an option to avoid being coerced and to have um, a platform to look out for their interests with respect to things like water. One piece that is, is related to the water question that um, doesn't get talked a lot about um, in terms of Asian security discussions, but it's something that's almost certainly going to happen. Um, I would say certainly is going to happen and is going to disproportionately affect Asia, um, which is the effects of climate change. Um, the UN, as many of you know, released a report about the potential for uh, temperatures to rise between one and, uh, about one and a half degrees Celsius um, by the end of the century, uh, including in their report is that sea levels uh, will rise between one and three meters by the end of the century. Think about what that means for Asia. Where so many people live in, in vulnerable coastal areas um, in China and around, and especially in Southeast Asia. Think about in Bangladesh or in Indonesia. Um, these rising sea levels, for example, in Indonesia, rising sea levels could make 2,000 islands disappear. Um, there's a study done, I actually just wrote this down, a study done um, just last year on the implications of rising sea levels, that two, a two meter rise in sea levels in Asia would displace 60 million people, in fact, hundreds of millions of people, um, affecting 52 million people in China alone. This is a major security issue. Think about the refugees, about the food insecurity crisis, disease, all the uh, implications that come from displacing these people. And this is something that's going to happen. That's going to happen. Um, and that's going to have significant implications for stability uh, in China, uh, and especially in South and Southeast Asia challenge the ability of the United States, China, other uh, countries that provide public goods that conduct humanitarian and uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations, challenge our ability to keep up uh, with uh, rapid scale. Um, I mentioned the 2,000 islands. Uh, the other stat that, that broke out to me at these discussions, Bangladesh, I'm sorry, not Bangladesh, Bangkok would be completely underwater. Uh, but uh, unless we have major infrastructure um, programs to support these cities, to support these areas, something that's going to happen. Absolutely. And um, even though the current administration is not doing anything about it, um, it's something that the, that the region can't ignore. Rather just thinking about the future, thinking about stability in the region, can't, can't ignore either. And um, on the Pakistan question, um, based on our earlier discussions, we were talking about how the treatment, China's treatment internally of its Uyghurs, could uh, affect its other relations with Muslim countries more in Southeast Asia. Yet we, uh, the earlier discussion was about how yet China, Pakistan's relationship is more likely to be more resilient, um, and that that important role of Pakistan in the Belt and Road Initiative as an important corridor. Um, so the question of re-education camps in Pakistan, I think, in the future, I think, still is an open question at this point. 
Sophia Chang with United Daily News Group Taiwan.、Um, we usually ask about the China factor, but I hope you can talk about U.S. factor in the cross-strait relations. As recent report、um, suggests that DOD has a plan to show off force in Taiwan Strait and South China Sea, and also U.S. may have more arms sales to Taiwan by the end of the year.、Um, how will these actions by the U.S. affect cross-strait relations? Thank you. Hi,、uh, <clears throat> excuse me. My name's Eli Turk. I'm a recent SICE graduate.、Um, this question is for Mr. Denmark. I was wondering if you could talk about the、uh, conventional mission of the Second Artillery and then the Rocket Force and how that affects sort of their their strategy going forward. And、um, and then if you could also, if you have time, comment on sort of、uh, the People's Liberation Army Navy's future relationship with the Rocket Force and who's going to be responsible for the SSBNs. And that. Thank you. Um, so, since we only have about five minutes left, we'll keep it to those two questions.、Um, feel free to approach the table and speak to us one on one after. Looking at、uh, U.S. factor cross rate issues,、um, and also questions about the second artillery, the new、uh, rocket force, and also the PLA Navy. Just、um, my quick answers, and we could definitely talk about the PLA, the really nerdy PLA stuff, one on one if you want.、Um, in terms of Taiwan. Um, the current administration has been、um, a bit on both sides of the Taiwan question. That sometimes they signal、uh, a change in how the U.S. thinks about and talks about Taiwan,、um, mostly rhetorically.、Um, there's the call between President Tsai and the President-elect,、um, signaling something maybe changing that didn't really、uh, come to much. But there's often rumors about something big going to happen soon.、Um, the arms, the the practical. Things that I've seen, though, from the administration, from the and other um, um, deployments, have been actually fairly consistent with past administrations. The only major change that I've seen is that when there were、um, a few a few months ago, a few weeks ago, when、um, some Navy Taiwan Strait,、uh, they made it public and、uh, very purposefully made it public,、um, which was different than past practice. So, when when I think about how the the U.S. is engaged, the, the U.S. factor, as you said.、Um, I tend to try to emphasize substance over symbolism. Symbolism is easy. It's, I say it's easier. It it makes you feel good for a little bit,、um, but it it often、um, at times drives a retaliation by the Chinese that doesn't hurt the United States. It hurts Taiwan. So when I think about what the U.S. can and should do when,、um, when it comes to Taiwan policy, the, to me the first question is, how does this help Taiwan? How does this help cross strait stability? Um, and and thinking about the substance, the substantive impact before the the symbolic gesture that that you're thinking of.、Um, in terms of Second Artillery Corps and those questions,、um, there's still a lot that I don't know about where these things are. The question they raise that he's pointing to is that if there's going to be nuclear capabilities on a PLA Navy ship, who has control over the nuclear weapons, right?、Um, um, and even though it's not the Second Artillery Corps anymore, we still sort of think of it in that way.、Um, I've heard lots of different ideas、um, that nuclear control could be actually turned over to the Navy.、Um, my favorite idea is what I call the the Humphrey Red October option, where you have the the second artillery guy there with the key, and you have the Navy guy there with the key, and they both have to turn it.、Um, there's probably a political fix to the U.S. Right. There's, <laughs> there's probably a political commissar, so there's maybe three keys.、Um, I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, um, I suspect that once they came to an answer, everybody stopped talking about it. Um, but I don't know actually where where that came out. That's just not something. Well,、um, I, I I think、um, Abe characterized the opportunities and pitfalls for Taiwan in the current administration's approach. I think the specific policies、um, deployments you described are necessary.、Um, Look, there's no doubt Beijing has been ramping up the pressure、mm -hmm. on Taiwan across every domain. Diplomatic, economic, information, and especially military. And in my view, and I think Randy Shriver, who's speaking next, is all over this and and knows it better than just about anybody in this town. <clears throat> and I'm in my view, we should be pushing back in every domain.、Um, yeah, so the military moves are appropriate.、Um, but I, you know, I did. Taiwan policy has largely run out of the White House in most administrations. So Dennis Wilder and I and others had had this、um, when we were in the Bush administration. And Chen Shui-bian. Ran down trust in Washington、It、was unfortunate,、um, and we tried to build it with some success back up. But、um, 
uh, in any administration, you always have to be a little bit worried about um, somebody who doesn't know the importance of Taiwan or doesn't understand the security issues. Most often, that's the Treasury Secretary, <laughs> <laughs> frankly. <laughs> being convinced by, I don't know, Liu He, for example, or someone in China, that there could be an economic deal if you stopped arms sales to Taiwan or something like that. <clears throat> um, and so um, I support all these moves, but I hope the administration's building a broad consensus beyond just the national security establishment that these are important. I, I, I think the Congress is in a much better place on Taiwan than it was five, 10 years ago, for example. And the administration now, I think, is quite good on Taiwan. But there are some people who are in the mix who are not national security types who are looking for big deals with China. And it's always tempting for Beijing to say, you could have that big deal on economics or whatever if you stopped arms sales to Taiwan. So I hope the administration internally is sewing up the seams and making sure that, that uh, division strategy, that wedge strategy in Washington won't work. Um, so with that, let's join me in thanking the panelists for this discussion. And uh, we won't keep you from lunch and from Randy. We'll resume at 1230. So grab the food and eat.